Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me on this Wednesday, November 9th in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. Luis Sorrell is here today to look back at her incredible career that spans over six decades on stage, television, and film. Daytime audiences know and love her for her role as Vivian Alamein on Days of Our Lives, Augusta Wainwright on Santa Barbara, and Emily Tanner on Beacon Hill. In addition to those, Louise has also appeared on All My Children, One Life to Live, Passions, and Port Charles in smaller roles. She received her theatrical training at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York and be began performing on stage at 15 years old. She spent several, several years on Broadway and made her film debut with The Party's Over in 1965. She has appeared in Plaza Suite, Night Gallery, The Return of Charlie Chan, Airplane to the Sequel, Where the Boys Are, and Crimes of Passion, to name a small few. She has made guest appearances on more than 50 primetime television programs and TV movies, including Star Trek, The Fugitive, Bonanza, Route 66, The Big Valley, Vegas, Heart to, Heart, to Heart, The Incredible Hulk, Hawaii Five-0, Magnum P.I., and one of my absolute favorites, Charlie's Angels, to share a small few. It's my pleasure to welcome to the locker room, Louise Sorrell. Hello. Hi, Louise. I should be dead, according to what you said. <laughs> did, that, did that tire you out? I wrote, I wrote a piece, uh, Thelma Ritter's dead, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've had quite the career. Um, I thank you for being here. Thank you to Judy Bly Wilson for connecting us. Oh, yeah. She's How, a sweetheart. Do you know her from All My Children or did you know her? No, I met her really through my friend Francesca James. Yeah. And, and um, Judy, I don't think cast me. Uh, they just, at that point, I sort of, they just called me. Well, I mean, I, she must have something to do with it, but they just called me to come in and do a couple of. Um, shows for them on all my children but she's become a really good friend she's just the most adorable little southern lady I love her she's a sweetheart yeah it was a pleasure uh, getting to know her yeah um, tell me where did your love of theater and the classics begin well I it it began in Hollywood high school uh, when I saw you know you fill out what, what classes you want to take and I saw drama and I thought, well, that could be easy because I hated taking math, et cetera. Uh, so I went into that class and the teacher was a man who became a performer on General Hospital. His name was John Ingle. Uh -huh. And for, he knew something about me because he started throwing me on the stage doing Irish plays, John Millington Singh and doing Medea and doing Serafina and Rose Tattoo. I, he knew something and I was hooked. It was just, it was theater and boys. <laughs> and Which one were you hooked on more? <laughs> both, I hate to admit, but. <laughs> Do you remember the first play you ever stepped foot on stage for? Yes, it was the John Millington Singh play, Riders to the Sea. And I was 14 or 15. Wow. And I out came an Irish dialect. I don't know where it came from. Maybe because my father was a film producer and my mother was called the new Garbo in New York. In, Hollywood. Not that either of them really talked to me about that or suggested it, but there was something I was getting, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, oh, that's, I something, that's was, something to pull out of your hat at 14 years old, an Irish accent. It, without. Yes. I didn't know. I honestly, he, he gave me Serafina and the Rose Tattoo, which is of course the, the infamous, uh, what's her name? Um, so, I can't think of who played it. That wonderful actress, she is terrible. Anyway, it was a, it's a heavy role. It's the mother, it's not the, the daughter. Uh, I would normally be the daughter, but in fact, my mother gave me things to do so that I could, I, my voice dropped and I became this Italian woman at 14. I, I don't know. Crazy. And she helped me a lot. And, and where was Hollywood High School? In Ho Hollywood, California? Where is it? <laughs> Hollywood, California? Hollywood and Sunset Boulevard and Highland. So how did you end up in New York? I Okay. When I was 18, having done a lot of theater by then in college, 
I thought, I have to get out of here. I, I have to go to New York because that's where the theater is. So um, I announced that I was going and my parents just said, how are you going to get there? <laughs> Mind you, we had a few dollars then, but they just said, how are you going to get there? I, I, who's, how are you going to pay for the airfare? And I said, I'll get a job. So I got this really ridiculous job in a Vic Tanny office. That's a long story. And I made my airfare. I paid my, then of course it was cheaper and there was no jet. I mean, it was, you know, prop plane, whatever. Um, and I auditioned at UCLA for the Neighborhood Playhouse and I got a scholarship. Wow. So that's how I got to New York. That's incredible. I mean, you were living in the heart of, you know, the entertainment capital and you know, your love of the stage drew you to the Big Apple. Yeah, I also knew that it would be healthier for me to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go into all that, but yeah, of I, course. I, I, I mean, I just, I, I'm very grateful that I was able to do it, that they let me go. And I, so I said, I am never going home again. But I did, of course. I did. Did you uh do you remember the first Broadway show you went to see when you arrived? I didn't go when I first arrived because I didn't have any money to do that. But someone <laughs> <laughs> someone took me to see, if you can believe this, my first Broadway show at the Broadway Theater, Ethel Merman in Gypsy. Wow. I cannot tell you. We were in the balcony and when her voice hit this the, the audience. I was shaking. That was my first introduction to a Broadway show. Somebody took me. I didn't have, you know, I, ironically, that's where I auditioned for my first Broadway show. That oh, was really think. odd. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and having a love of theater, stepping on a Broadway stage for your first Broadway role, was that magical? <sighs> Would you mean the audition or the actual opening? Act, your actual first time working on the stage, on a Broadway stage. Well, that was my, that would be the audition that I had for the show, which was Take Her, She's Mine. I, I just remember looking from the side door of the theater and seeing actors kind of following the stage manager around. And I thought, that, I got to do something else. I got to make her follow me around. So I, that was in my head. And then I went upstairs and I was thinking I was a basket case. I mean, it's terrifying. There were so many people auditioning for this. And I went up a few flights and sat on the steps and thought and thought and thought. And then I wasn't ready. And I came down and said, I'm not prepared. And the, <laughs> the stage manager said, Miss Sorrell is not prepared to George Abbott, who was out in the middle of the house. I, I mean, I just, oh, what I was... <laughs> And I went back upstairs and I came back and I said, I'm ready now. Oh, Miss Sorrell is ready now. <laughs> and I came out, I forced the stage manager, who was a wonderful, wonderful woman named Ruth Mitchell, who worked for Hal Prince a lot. And I, I jutted out on the stage and she had to follow me. And that, that was the character. I mean, the character was sort of a Betty David kind of, you know, the grand, she was in college, but she thought she was grand. So that's how it first happened. And I, I don't know where I got the guts to do that. I, I don't know. I didn't know that I was doing anything. Right. You know, out of well, the ordinary. You, you, you were 18, you said, right? Uh, no, then I was, I graduated the playhouse at 20. I was 21. 21. Still at 21. Um, fans are thrilled to see you. Cindy says, oh my God, Louise, you've always been one of my favorites. You are such oh. a big light to everything you so do. Sweet. I just adore you. And uh, we have fans watching from France because they are big Santa oh. Barbara's. Santa Barbara. Yes, Paris. we were huge in Paris. Yeah, uh, I did an award show there. This the César, and I was—I've never been so frightened in my life. And I did it with a very famous journalist over there. I can't, and I was wearing—they gave me wonderful clothes to wear. And when I came out, everybody was screaming and carrying. I thought, oh, they really love. No, what happened was my top flew open, and I was wearing a see-through top underneath that. And that's, <laughs> I was told that the next day about what wonderful, well, uh, you know, breasts you have. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Oh my God. Oh, but anyway, wow. I love Paris. I love, I love it. I've spent a lot of time there. Um, Tony uh, answered your uh, 
helped out. Maureen Stapleton was who you were thinking of earlier, right? For Serafina? Was it Maureen? No, Stapleton? no, no, no. It was uh, Anna Magnani. Okay. okay. Magnani did the movie, but thank you anyway. I know <laughs> Maureen's wonderful. No, it was the Anna Magnani. At that time, I'd only seen Magnani do it in the movie. Wow. Do you, do you have a favorite stage role that you've played? Not yet. <laughs> oh, I love it. I did like, I will say, but it was so short uh, lived. It was a play called The Sign in Sidney Brewstein's Window. And I played Rita Moreno's sister in that. And we had a short run because um, the, the show just didn't take off. We had like three months or something. And it was a wonderful role of Gloria, who's the sister, who was a sad kind of character. But um, I wished I'd had more chance to work on that because that was uh, very special. What was Elaine, she like? Who? Rita. Oh, she's like what you see. Yeah. God, she's an angel. She's a God-given, phenomenal human being. Oh, my God. Look at her now. She's I, phenomenal. I know. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree. I can't, can't believe. Uh, Jacob, hello from Israel. Augusta was my grand's favorite and Vivian was my oh, favorite. Oh. Burying people alive, falling off, hot, <laughs> falling off a hot air balloon. She can do it all. Watch, <laughs> watching you now feels like home. Thank you both. Wow. Oh, uh, lovely. lovely. I love that. How did you make your transition uh, to your first film role, The Party's Over? Or The yeah, the I didn't. Guy. I was on stage in Take Her, She's Mine. Another thing, I mean, I'm so grateful. My wonderful agent sent me to meet um, the director, Guy Hamilton, and Anthony Perry and Jack Hawkins were in town looking for a woman, a female, to play this role. And she sent me to meet them, and I met them briefly, and I thought I was going to read, but there was no reading. Um, and I walked out. I mean, I didn't know who anything. Oh, they came to see Take Her, She's Mine. And I was mortified that they were going to, you know, these are three phenomenal British people. And <laughs> anyway, in intermission, they called me downstairs and said, Louise Sorrell, come downstairs. And there they were backstage at intermission, reached out a hand to me and said, we'll see you overseas. That's how it happened. Wow. I, I, I mean that's a way that that's a way to start a film career. Would have been had I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but I mean, still to you know, here you are on stage, and and then they say, "See you overseas." Oh, I I mean, none of this hit me until much later. At that time, it was like, oh, you know, I'm just getting to work. I'm going to work. I'm doing this. And when I think back at how how these things happened, you know, I I'm so grateful most people go through a hell of a lot before they even get a job you know it's there are so many things people have to do and wait and pray and and i was very lucky very lucky yeah i mean <laughs> that's a and where did it film london nice had you been before no the next year the next year I went back and got another one of those things. I had worked for Alex Cohen in a disaster play. He called me one morning, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm sleeping. What do you, you know, I was <laughs> 22. And he said, well, pack your bag. You've got to go to London. Because I had read for a play called um, Man and Boy by Terence Radigan here for, excuse me, but Charles Boyer in his apartment. Th that's all it was, right? And I read for him, and then they went off to do the play in London. And he didn't like the girl who was an American, whom I actually knew, who was doing it, that they cast in London. And he, Alex just called me and said, pack your bags, you're getting on a flight. So I went back to London to do the play. I mean, incredible. <laughs> I mean, to be, I mean, I hope you take all of that in, you know, still and, you know, the gratitude that must feel like. Um, do you have a favorite film role you've had? Another, not yet. 
I love, hey, that's the way to put stuff into the universe. I, I um, think I'm, I've been retired, but nobody bothered to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You know, you, hey, you could, don't, don't ever say it. You know, somebody mm -hmm. might watch this, see you, you know, they'll, yeah. they'll come knocking. They'll come knocking. Um, I said it in the intro, so many TV series, so many, you know, primetime shows. And as I said, you know, one of my favorites, Charlie's Angels. Do you remember anything about that? You're working <laughs> with Sarah Ladd? Uh, no, not Sarah Ladd. What was her name? Sarah Ladd. Cheryl. Cheryl, I'm sorry. No, Cheryl. I didn't hear you. Oh, my God. There was the funniest thing that happened. You know, you're bringing up all these amazing memories. Oh. There was a film, an Italian film do, done by this wonderful Italian director who's now leaving. I can't think of her name now. And Giancarlo Giannini was in it. And in that movie, God, I can't, there was a huge woman playing a character in it. Mm -hmm. I thought she was Italian or something. You know, she played, he, he had a scene with her. I mean, she was this very large person. Okay. <sighs> I get this show and I go on, I look at, you always look at the cast list and you yeah, yeah. I see her name. And I thought, oh, this woman from Giannini's film is coming to be on Charlie's Angels and an Italian, you know, on and on. She came to the set, she came on, she was a little late and she introduced herself. I, I must have got, I don't remember her name now. Shirley Stoller. That's right. You got it. And I thought she was French or Italian or German or, you know, well, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, my God. She came on the set. She was she didn't know what to do. She was panic stricken. I ended up driving her around. And then she spoke. She's from Brooklyn. <laughs> She's like, I said, what? I mean, it just absolutely shattered me because I was panting, waiting for her to come on the set because I saw her in a Giannini film. <laughs> she says, hello, where are you going? I got to go. I can't get there. I, would, I said. What? <laughs> oh my God. That's the biggest. That's what I remember from the Charlie's Angels. Everybody else was very but, nice. But that's a that's a great story. Oh and she was and she she was great in that too. I mean, she was scary in that. In oh my God. Well, she I had these images and it was building and building because she didn't come the first day, it was like the second day or the third day. And then she came on the set with the Brooklyn accent and she, I ended up driving her. I don't know what, I ended up driving her around somewhere. I don't remember. <laughs> Cho chauffeuring her. Oh, God. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Um, you were also, you know, you still are a part of the Star Trek universe playing Raina in Requiem for Methuselah episode. All these years, what is it like being part of the Trekkie universe? You know, I think any of us who were still saying, when, you, when you're an actor and you're going on to do a show, you know, and you're a serious, well, serious actor or whatever, you know, trying to do good work, and you walk on a set with, well, you know what the Star Trek set looked like. I mean, we didn't know how forward thinking Gene Roddenberry was. Or I certainly didn't, because it was like, what if they wrapped this dress around me and James, um, what's her name? Has uh, been, William uh, Shatner? No, James Daly, James Daly, who played, you know, Methuselah. James Daly's in a <laughs> leotard and tights. I mean, it was like we were looking at each other saying, what, what are we doing? You're like, who's going to watch this? Christmas money, Christmas money. <laughs> We didn't realize what it was, honestly. And I mean, Bill and I just, we had played husband and wife on a Route 66 or something. So we knew each other and I laughed a lot because he's very funny. I, I, we got on quite nicely. And nobody thought this was the first series, you know, this first season. I don't think they knew what they had at that point. They just did it. And then it, what happened was phenomenal. Phenomenal. I mean... To this day, people. Oh my you know, God! I get you know. I get mail almost every other day with photographs, and I always know it's going to be Star Trek pictures. It, it, it's a phenomenon. Yeah. Really, I mean, it, it's spectacular. The what Space it. Frontier is a phenomenon. <laughs> really? Yeah. That yeah. Is, yeah, crazy. I mean, it really, and and to think how long ago, and and the fact that people. Uh, 
still talk about it. Oh, they, yes, they do. Yeah. I, I could tell you a quick story if, you, if we have enough time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My dear friend, whom I think you're going to speak to, Francesca James. Um, oh, she, you did speak to her. Uh, yeah. She from she's always giving me the most lovely, wonderful birthdays. I, I it's just the kind of person she is. Hugely generous, takes care of everybody. So for one of my birthdays, she took the episode that I was in, and at the end of the show, I I come out and I'm I'm falling apart because I'm in love with Bill Shat. I don't know. I'm all confused, and I say I choose, I choose, and I drop dead. So she took that segment and there's a fight scene a little before that happens between, I think, Bill and James Daly or something that looked almost like a kind of a fay ballet. I mean, if you think anyway, that's how she saw it. So there's James in his leotard and they're having this fight. And a couple of friends of ours dubbed in things like Anna one and a two and a tergete. They just <laughs> make it ballet. And then I came out and she mouthed me. She put in my mouth. <laughs> and I came out going, <laughs> I'm saying, I choose, I choose. And she put in my mouth, we need Jews. <laughs> Lots of Jews. Oh, my God. So clever. Oh, my God. And, and so it was at a big birthday she gave me. And the place fell apart. It was hilarious. That's really a smart, smart. Hilarious. Oh, that is a thoughtful, smart, and funny <laughs> gift. That's wonderful. I love that. I want to read what Kay Kennedy says. As a dramatic little boy growing up in Mississippi, soaps were my escape. I watched Louise on Santa Barbara, One Life Days. Your characters were elegant, glamorous, and cunning, something I still aspire to. <laughs> oh, me too. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Thank my you. God. Do, do you have a favorite primetime role? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't... Uh, maybe not. I don't know. There were so many, you know, sometimes something jogs my memory and I think, gee, that was that was really fun to do. But um, And you worked with Bill Shatner, uh, not just on Star Trek, something else as well, right? Yeah, Route 66. Great. Yeah, we, we were husband and wife on that. Way well, back, way back. He's a wonderful actor. He's always been a good actor. I mean, Star Trek is not, you know, is a different kind of a thing to do. But Bill was always a good, he was a stage actor. I mean, he's a good actor. Very good. Yeah. I, I agree. I think, like, it's not where you shine Star Trek, you know, right? No, I mean, it was wonderful for him. But it, it's, uh, he was a serious stage actor, you know, he, well, we all were, <laughs> you know, you just yeah, don't know. Absolutely. Do you, how did the role of Augusta Rainwright come about? Uh, well, I went and met the Dobsons and I left because they said, oh, we're, we're, we're testing a lot of people. So I said, this is going to sound snotty. Uh, maybe it was, I don't know. I don't think it I said, well, I wish you luck. And I left. Then the phone rang. So that's how it happened. And um, I read that people were telling you not to do soaps, right? Who were those people? I should have. I don't know. I, I saw an interview. I think you had said that some people were. Well, you know, it it does something. I must say, not for everyone, but it people have attitude. Not New York because. New York soaps used the best actors in New York and they were doing because they were in theater and they wanted to supplement their income or whatever and they got wonderful actors. In California, soaps are looked down on in terms of okay. quality, you know, the actors, etc. So people were saying, not enough maybe, but anyway, uh, some friends said, mm, no. Yeah. And I'd been sitting around for a while and... Uh, I talked to some friends who were doing soaps and I, a couple of them were th also theater people. And they said, well, try do it for a while. See what you think. <laughs> um, and, and actually, I have you, to you say. Did for, you did it for a little while. A little while. <laughs> I have to say, though, on Santa Barbara, 
We had Nick Coster. We had theater people. Lane Davies. Excuse me. Dame Judith Anderson, who became my girlfriend. <laughs> so, I mean, I thought, what's so bad about this? We would have rehearsals and we created. We were left alone at lunch hour and we improvised. And I said, this is like doing theater. So Every it, day, every day almost. Yes. And we had serious <laughs> actors on that show. And uh, we... It was a beginning, you know, it was a brand new show. So it, that made it more interesting because they didn't have anything set in their minds. They were watching it kind of come to life. And we could play a little bit. And we did. I mean, we would rehearse a scene at lunch hour and improvise it and then say, we've got an idea. We've got, and they would let us do it. Wow. So I thought it was, you know, great. Things happened later on that were not. But um, in the beginning, I had a great time. Did you, had you watched any soap prior to sen never working? Never seen a soap. soap. I'd never seen one. That's wild. I, I love that. Yeah. Um, talk about your friendship with Dame Judith Anderson. Oh, I wrote a piece about her. She was, well, here, I'll, here's, a, everybody was intimidated. I had to meet her up in Santa Barbara. We were shooting there for in the beginning in a leopard bikini. And they said, you have to come over and say hello. And I said, oh, please, please, not now. I can't. I have to be in a gown. And they said, no, this is the only time we have. And she's here. So I went over and I introduced myself. And I'm like, I'm, trying, I'm so uncomfortable. And she was saying she didn't like the name of the character that she was going to play. They wanted her to call Birdie or something. She hated it. So I said, this is coming from my mother. I said, what about Medea? And she looked at me and she said, Medea, my dear. I mean, I froze. <laughs> now, and there, they said, now we have to take some pictures. So we, I'm in a bikini, and I'm, I'm mortified. So we sit down. I still, the picture exists. I think it's online. Uh, my girl, the, the girl playing my daughter, the sweet girl playing my daughter, Judith sit, is sat in a chair, and I'm sitting on a, the chair arm on the right side of her and she turns her proboscis towards me which lands pretty much on my left breast at which point she said well there they are aren't they if you can you imagine this is my introduction to dame judith anderson from then on <laughs> she finally she thought they were shooting it in santa barbara she was horrified to find out that she had to go to los angeles to burbank to shoot this so if limo would bring her home down to LA with her dachshund Bozo. Oh, well, Bozo. What a great name. Bozo. Bozo. And they would howl together. Uh, and the first day, I swear to God, this was just before my birthday. She knew it was my birthday. She came up to me while I was in the makeup chair, took my hand and put the most beautiful turquoise ring on my finger. And I said, what? Well, she said, oh, darling, I wore that in and I've forgotten a play, a Broadway show. I want you to have it for your birthday. I, the whole place froze, the whole makeup room froze. I, I'm getting chills to sing about it. And I ran to my dressing room and called my mother to tell her what had just happened. That was the beginning of us. Um, I came to, I flew to New York with her. She took me to get a face facial she was 86 at the time or 86. and I, I we had facials together and then she came out and said how do I look I said oh well, you look at least 84 you know I mean it was like <laughs> that's how she was that was the kind of person you could you know play with what do you miss most about her everything hmm. everything she was a flirt she would have her 11.30 Bloody Mary or whatever. <laughs> and I said, Judith, you shouldn't do this at the hour. Oh, darling, I'm pickled. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have pictures of her here with, with, with um, a playwright now. I can't think of his name. Uh, Evelyn Waugh. I, they were in my living room. Wow. I, I, you know, I... She introduced me to a lot of wonderful people and she was bawdy. 
uh, she had this dark sense of humor and she was such a, she was a friend. She really was. I mean, what a, what a thing to have in your life. Yeah. Well, so what a gift Dana Barbara gave you. It did. Absolutely. Everything about it. I loved it. I thought they were witty. The writing was witty. It was funny. I mean, we, Nick and I had wonderful things. I would kill to have that stuff again. It, it was so mad. It was mad. Yeah, I could imagine because he, you, you and he seem very, you know, I got to interview him as well. And you both seem like you have that fun, spirited, same personality. Of, yeah, of, Nicky is, he's quite the character. Like, he let's is. have a we'll good never, time. Yeah, we'll never lose each other. Oh, that, that's sweet. I love that. I love yeah. that. And you mentioned Lane and, and Nancy Lee Gron. Yes. Talk, Working with Nancy. Yeah. I used to call her Nancy Groan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she'll mind my saying. I love her. She's eccentric. She's a fighter. She's a good actress. Uh, we worked really well together as sisters. Um, she's just very unique. She really is. She's a good she's soul. She's a spirited lady from, you know, I don't know her well, but I, you know, I, yeah. I see her posts. Oh, yeah. I, I used to post, but I got taken off Facebook three times, uh, <laughs> threatened, basically. And I, I don't go on any social media anymore, but I know Nancy does do that. You know, she's uh, she's she a brave sticks up, She sticks up for what she believes. She does. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. No, nothing, not, nothing wrong with that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have a favorite storyline from Santa Barbara? A couple of them. One was... <laughs> One was where I supposedly go blind, which is not funny, but it was like a retina, something happened and I blind for a convenient few days. And uh, <laughs> they had Ronnie Shell. You know, Ronnie Shell, he's a comedian. Mm -hmm. He's hilarious. You cannot look at him without laughing. So he's on the show and Nikki is now, they're doing Cyrano. Nikki has brought Ronnie into take me out of my depression. So he's writing sort of Cyrano notes to Ronnie. And then Ronnie says them to me because obviously I can't see him. So I'm being swept away by this romantic moment with this person I don't know, except that I could see him and Nick and we couldn't get through a scene because I'm supposed to be blind and not see anything. But we couldn't, we fell on, I, have a, I think there's a shot of us falling over on the couch. Just could not get through. But in any way, this storyline is, Nikki as a romantic moment takes me to the Hearst Castle. What they did is they set up on the studio, on the set, a huge ladder that went up to some kind of platform, which Nikki would say, we're climbing up the steps now, Augusta. We're going to get on the plane and then we're going to go to the Hearst <laughs> Castle. So, of course, I can see all of this, but I can't. And we're sitting up there and there's an engine thing that run in a rudder and everything starts going. And he says, oh, God, Augusta, this is so much fun. We'll be landing soon. And I'm, I'm supposed to not. And I think the audience knows I've gotten back my sight, but I can't let them know. So we land and he walks up to a door, which I can see, but I'm not seeing. And we open the door. <laughs> there's a fireplace in space. I mean, there's nothing around it. He said, oh, Augusta, wait till you see this room. It's so beautiful. There's a fire going. And behind the fire was a guy, you know, a prop guy <laughs> waving at me. <laughs> and I'm to see this. So there's an empty place with a fire going on. And then there's this huge bed. That's all that's in the room. But Nikki is saying, oh, Augusta, wait. Till you, you can't believe this furniture is so beautiful. It's one another time. And it's her taste. I mean, it's going on and on and on. It was so much fun. It was so ridiculous. I love that. that. You know, you you just it was like a just magical, crazy stuff that they wrote. I mean, they uh, were. I love that. Kevin says Augusta with Breeze the dog was my favorite. Oh, I had a Doberman. Yeah. Um, Tony says uh, he told me about a letter you got from President Reagan. <laughs> what? Yes. Oh my God, these people are wonderful that remember these. Yes, saying, I'm so sorry you've gone blind. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. Did, did you think it was real? 
Well, it what came from the White House. We're right, but at first, when you first got it, like it must have been like a, you know. <laughs> we couldn't believe it. I think we we were going to send a note back to the White House or something, and then somebody said, "Don't, don't, don't do that." Or I don't know. I love that. And you mentioned um, comedian. You also got to work with Don Rickles. I mean, how do you hold the <laughs> How do you hold the straight face opposite Don? No, <laughs> it wasn't so much him, but they brought on everybody who he couldn't look at. Bob Newhart. I mean, everybody came on that show and then you couldn't get through a scene. Okay, It was insane. And they all came to see the show. And I actually got to have, spend an evening with all of these, all of them, all those comics at a delicatessen on Fairfax Avenue. I'll never get over it. I mean, I loved him, Don. I loved him. He was such a, he really was a, a pussycat. You know, if he thought he ever hurt anybody, he would just be horrified. But he he managed to embarrass me quite a few times. I can imagine. He is one of my favorites. I mean, yeah. watch him and, there's, you know, he opens his mouth and you smile. <laughs> you know, and well, I, I couldn't believe they cast me in that. In fact, they actually, I auditioned or on tape or whatever, and they hired me and the network said, no, don't be ridiculous. She can't play his wife. She doesn't look like she could play his wife. And Sam Denoff uh, fought for me. Um, they, they, Sheldon Leonard, they fought for me because the network said that's ridiculous. It was a <laughs> fun combination. I, anyway, yeah. Oh, that's crazy. So I know you spent a year at One Life and I heard you say that the character didn't, you know, speaking of humor, didn't have any humor. So talk, talk to me about how that impacts you as a performer. Well, it doesn't mean, you know, I'm not the one to call whether something has humor or not. I, when I first went on there, I said, I hope she's funny or I hope she has a sense of humor. I did make that comment. And of course it didn't. Um, I left after a year. Um, I, I I don't know, you know, it's not my position to say what the, it's supposed to be, but in fact, they did bring me in. They flew me in and, you know, I said, well, I'd like, I'd hope that she would have a sense of humor because I don't think yeah. any character is interesting without it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that show was not humorous at the time. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Dave's yeah. Days um, came six months after you left Santa Barbara, I think, for the second time. Who? I'm sorry? Days of Our Lives. Oh, days, think. days, right, sorry. That's um, okay. Um, yes, I went off to Paris and then I thought, oh, I'll never work again. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mother, I think, or somebody called me and said, they want you back. I think. Oh, I no, think I read, yeah, I think you said your mother. Santa Barbara. Yeah. Back on Santa Barbara. Days. Days started and ran for, I ran, I guess, on that for, I don't remember how long, and then they they dropped me, and then they kept bringing me back in increments. Well, talk about getting the role of Vivian. What did you like about playing Vivian? Well, again, I didn't re read for it. I just met Ken, and uh, then it was... I don't think you read for much. I think you, you oh, know... I did. I did in regular, I mean, the other show, you know, yeah, but, not all of them, but sometimes I had to. Yeah, of course. But even starting us back, you know, when you were, you know, on Broadway and they said, come, you're going overseas to do the parties over. That was, yeah, I I can't explain. I can't explain that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's got to be a nice feeling. It was, but I didn't think about it at the time. I just said, oh, OK, I'm going. But, I, you know, when I look back on it, I say, oh, my God, what I know people have to go through. And I'm not saying... I, I don't know what to say about that. It's, it's no, well, you, you, I'm sure you went through, you know, uh, difficult moments trying to get parts, but there were some really nice rewards along the way. There were absolutely. And, and you were asking about days. Uh, I read, I read something and I thought, huh, um, I know what it was. I think either I said it or they said something about liaison dangereuse. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> and so the character, you know, the first day, I think I said something like, I don't ask, 
I shoot first and ask questions later. It was my first line or something like that. So I came in to protect my nephew. And um, they picked, uh, the person who really had the most fun with it was James Riley. When they brought him on, I mean, he, he's, he was n nuts what he wrote, but it was so much fun. It, yeah, yeah. Um, was, and your nephew was Michael Sabatino. Yeah, oh, what an angel. The sweetest man on the planet. He's such a, such a sweetheart. Such a great actor as well. He's lovely, he's lovely. We worked together before on Knott's Landing. Yeah, which didn't and, realize and he was something else on Knott's Landing. That, yeah, well, that I just did one. I just did one show. That character of Chip that he played. Um, and, and your character buried Carly alive, which is one of the most popular. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember reading? Did somebody t tell you first or did you read it? And like they wrote it and it said. Who the hell was? It? Oh, Vivian. Vivian does a jig. And I went, I swear to God, I did this. I was such a pain in the neck. I went upstairs and I said, I don't jig. <laughs> and the producer at the time said, what, what do you want to do? I said, I have no idea. I'm going down on the set at lunch hour and I'll figure it out. So I started, I don't know where it came from. I started circling the grave. That's, that's after she was buried. And I did this thing about she loves me, she loves you not with a rose and dropping petals. And I don't know, they kept it, they, they liked it. But um, also I thought that uh, she was you know, com committed to it. It was nuts. I mean, they had me, I put a microphone in the coffin and I would say, hello, darling, did I wake you? I mean, they, they gave me <laughs> stuff like that. So how could you not have fun? I mean- and I was just gonna say that that's gotta be just like a actor's dream. Well, we committed. That's it. I mean, we should have been committed, but we committed. <laughs> James should have been committed long ago. Yes. <laughs> <James> Riley. <laughs> yeah, but he gave me some funny. I mean, one morning I walked in and my the wonderful make wardrobe guy on that Richard Bloor just worked so hard. He's so wonderful. And he said, I don't think you want to know what you're wearing tomorrow. And I said, Richard? He said, no, no, we'll just don't, let it be a surprise. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Walk in the next morning, and there's a huge box of French fries standing in the wardrobe room. I said, What the hell? He said, That would be you. What was that for? Well, Yvonne, the butler, was a hamburger. I was French fries. <laughs> I mean, you know, you have to. We supposedly, I'd run out of money or something. I was desperate. So we're on the street trying to make money as a box of French fries and a hamburger. <laughs> God. You know, I never knew. I, I once I was Carmen Miranda with a with a bowl of fruit on my head. I mean, it, it, how can you not have fun with that? It, it it was crazy, and it's not serious theater, but it was entertaining. I think it was it was a lot of humor. You know, which yeah. I, I I swear to God, no it, matter what it is, Chekhov humor is. Uh, it's huge. It's very essential. Oh my God. It, 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 it is everything. Robert says the buried alive story could have made Vivian unforgivable. How do you ensure she doesn't go too far for fans to like? And David says Vivian was nutsy, but fun nutsy. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I mean, that's that you have to, they have to still like you. I mean, if you, if you play, you know, if you play mean, if you play ugly, mean, and all of that, people don't want to watch that. And p truthfully, I won't get into politics, certain people <laughs> who are playing very nice are doing god-awful things. And that, you know, you, you can't play, uh, I, when you say I hate you, you don't act, I hate you. That's laughable. Unless it's coming out from a deep place and it's painful. But if you if you play mean, that, uh, people don't do that. Well, I won't get into politics, but um, they smile and they're mean. And they're stabbing you in the back. Um, right. You know, two incredibly popular daytime roles. Um, did you come to love that work? Uh, 
yes, when it when it resonated, uh, there were times where I, I was very uncomfortable, and I spoke up, and probably <laughs> they didn't appreciate that because they want you to just come and do your work. I understand that, but I can't help it. So I most of the time, I was I was happy with it. Sometimes you know I just felt, uh, and I I could see it in the work discomfort. Uh, and a kind of absence, you know, of what you're trying to do becomes empty, and it's hard. It's hard to work with that. But well, Jacob says Vivian almost getting a lobotomy was yet another iconic story. <laughs> I think that was the doctor, the crazy doctor, or something. I can't. I don't remember. I, I know it was with Joe. Maybe it was with Joe. I loved him. Joe Moscolo. Oh, a loss. Um, and you worked with John Aniston? Yeah. Oh, What's he like? Sweet. He's just the sweetest man. He's, you know, he's having a hard time. I'm sure people can know that by now. I mean, just age, et cetera, and all that. But he just... He's a twinkle in his eye, you know, you just, he was right there for you. And so gentle. Uh, I have such a soft spot for him. You, him. You've worked with some really great people, you know, at Days, at Santa Barbara, in, in all walks of your career. Yes, yes, I, I, I really... I sometimes think about it or I'm lying in bed and I can't go to sleep and I start counting all the wonderful people I worked with and thinking, well, that's pretty impressive, you know, just to pick up my spirits or something. Cause I mm -hmm. walk around during the day with my dog and I do the laundry and I do, and I, and I forget that I had, I did do something. <laughs> and maybe I'll do something else. One of these days. I don't know. Would, would you ever like to play Vivian again? Yeah. That has been sort of in the air. Um, I can't say anything because at this point, I don't know. It was, mm -hmm. they asked me uh, something and you never know. You never, you never know. know. Fans I know would love it. Well, I would love to, I mean, yeah, I'd like to do that. Uh, and I have a sister out in California, so that would make it doubly nice. A, a, dub a doubly good reason to head, to head west. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you talked about being committed when you buried Carly alive. Talk about your friendship with Crystal, uh, who's the doll. We instantly liked it, instant. It was just like, as soon as I met her. And we've spent some time together. Well, I, you know, she does these, um, I don't know what the, you know, the- Yeah, the, the web series. Web series, and I did- Beacon Hill. Beacon Hill. And uh, she couldn't be, she's so easygoing. She's so, uh, I mean, I was there when her first baby was born. I was at the hospital with her. Oh. So we go back and. and she's uh, a grandma now. I can't, I mean, I can't even, it's not <laughs> possible. It's just it's ridiculous. When I first saw her, I thought this woman should be in Europe in the movies with that face. Stunning. So, great face. Um, and we, we were just so comfortable, the three of us, really comfortable. Uh, she just never, she's just a real pro. And when, when we did the Beacon Hill thing with, um, Hit you know, every, thank you, Hillary. They're so terrific. These two women, just the, uh, there's no, yeah, I mean, you worked with Crystal as an actress and to see her take the charge that she does. Cause she yeah. is somebody who takes Without, charge of that. But she doesn't, you know, you wouldn't, she doesn't show it. She doesn't play at it. She, it, she's just there. And you can ask her, you know, there's no sense of I'm in charge or I'm this or that. None of that. It's the most wonderful atmosphere to work in. There's just no pressure. And it, it, yeah, uh, she she keeps going. You know, she's, I never, never thought I was surprised when she started producing. But um, both those women are just the nicest people. No attitudes, no, you know, just there doing and, their work. And like you, they both created iconic daytime characters. Yeah. On, yeah, on I'm many cool. shows like you, you know, you all have created these iconic characters on, on shows or played them on, on shows. Well, 
If you say so, I'll take that. I Absolutely. don't think of it that way, but um, it's hard for me to see that, really. Well, you know, think about it. Here we are, you know, how many years after Santa Barbara? We have people from Israel yeah. watch, you know, tuning in today because of the character you played, you know. It's a testament. Well, yeah. it, it was amazing. I mean, what the stunner for me was Moscow. Pardon me for even mentioning that country right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I went to Moscow with Jed Allen and his wife. Oh, wow. And we, I mean, we there were people around us. We had guards, but I mean, this is way before you know who is there now. Um, but we had guards and we, we were winding. I mean, it was unbelievable. And Estonia, we went to Estonia and then flew to Moscow. And the audience for, was a huge audience for just Jed and myself on stage. And I was like, my God, they knew every show. They knew every bit of dialogue. I mean, they, the Russians just, and they have now created Santa Barbara in Russia with Russians. They're doing that. And they took Putin through there, through the set. And they said they're trying to, they, cast it sort of with people who looked like us a bit. It is a show in Russia now. I can't, uh, and France also, France was um, very, you know, really on board with Santa Barbara. They really loved it. But the huh. Moscow thing was really a shocker. Amazing. Do you have a favorite city you visited? Well, I've traveled most for many years in my life, and I Paris is one of my favorites. Me too, I, Louise. Me too. Uh, yeah. and also, um, uh, down in uh, in Italy, in a, there's a little town called Città di Castello, where my childhood friend lives. She's a painter, uh -huh. and it's a beautiful area, Umbria. It's just beautiful. There are lots. I mean, the whole, there's so many beautiful places. Yeah, I, I agree. Italy is one of my favorites too, for sure. On Ve on uh, Beacon Hill, you got to work with my former colleague and friend Tina Sloan. Oh, <laughs> I love her. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> she's a good. She's a I good miss one. Her. She's moved away. Where the hell? She's in Florida or something. Florida, I think. Yeah. We would, you know, anyway. oh, we, <laughs> <laughs> we laughed a lot. She was great to work with. Yeah. Oh, she, yeah. I grew up watching and then worked on Guiding Light with her. So it was oh, really, oh, really fun. Yeah. Really. A great, she's a dame. She's a great dame. She yeah. Really and, and speaking of great dame, you were also, I hear, close friends with Marge Doucet. Yeah. Yeah. How did you two become friends? Well, it was partly just being in the same you know, business. She had to come in and replace me for four shows because I had an injury and I, she did about four shows and she was also on Santa Barbara. And I think because we were all New York, well, I'm not really from New York, but there's a New York crowd and we all connected and uh, that's a hard one. She's a great lady. M missed. She was. And I spent a lot of time with her before she died a lot. Uh. Uh, oh, I'm glad. You know, sad to lose Marge, but glad that you got to spend quality time with we her. We did. We did. That's awesome. She was and, just. And people, you know, I always love the stories people get to share about Marge because, you know, you 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 expect, you know, like Dame Judith, you know, somebody with, you know, uh, royalty, and then something, you know, wild will come out of Marge's mouth, and you just roll on the floor laughing. <laughs> It's called Edge. <laughs> she had Edge. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. People would tell stories. Um, wow. Somebody just said Nicholas Coster was married to Marge on Facts of Life. Okay. <laughs> I had no idea. I Love don't know. That. I think he <laughs> married <that>. everybody. <laughs> he did. He yeah. did. Um, you, you know, you... Um, so who you were just saying, oh, we were talking about Nancy Lee Grand, who you said speaks her mind. You also speak your mind. Where does that come from? 
my mother, uh, although she didn't speak it enough because she wasn't in a position to do that because she was long married. Um, but she had uh, a lot of style and she was, you know, then the trades called her the new Garbo. Uh, she was a brilliant artist, a, pa a pianist, quite a brilliant pianist and a painter. It was a lot to deal with, a lot to follow. And uh, she wasn't, I think I got a lot from her, but I, I don't, I'm not saying she spoke her mind because I mean, I left when I was 18. So I, but I got the sense of her, you know, that, that she was passionate and um, she was a reader and she was artistic and she developed a theater in Los Angeles. Uh, she was a force. She just, unfortunately didn't follow the career that she sh should have had. And I don't think she was ever happy about that. I think mm. that was a problem for her, but she didn't talk about it. They did, people didn't talk back then about- That's right. Yeah, people didn't talk. Um, what brought you back to New York? Have you always kept a place in New York? Oh, oh you... I see. You. Well, I fell in love with it when I first got here, you know, when I was 19 and I stayed here until I was about 24, and then I married this wonderful Herb Edelman, and we went to the West Coast. I swore I would never go home again. Well, he wanted to be an actor in Hollywood because he was from Brooklyn and he was talented and, you know, was doing Barefoot in the Park and all. So we went to Hollywood because he wanted to work out there, and I we went, and we worked a lot, and we'd always come back, visit, and I thought I've got to have a home in New York City. I have to. So I stayed with these people for years. And, and finally I said, I need my own. She said, oh, and they were very rich. So they had a big place. And I said, she said, well, you don't need anything. You have this. I said, no, no, mine. I need mine. So I bought this place that I'm in now as a pied-à-terre, which sounds kind of chic, but I just bought it. I wanted something here and I could afford it. It was very inexpensive then. And I thought, well, I have something now. That's and then one, one day in, when I was living in Westwood in a wonderful place and I wasn't working and I thought, what am I doing? I'm spending a fortune on rent here and I have this New York place. <laughs> so I sold tons of things and moved back to New York. And, and never looked back? Never. Oh, I, I love that. Um, the fans were asking because uh, a few times um, some other actors had to come in and play Vivian. Did you watch Linda Dano or Robin Strasser play her? They're both friends of mine. <laughs> uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't. And I have not, not saying anything. I just, yeah. they had called me to come back and it was COVID. I just couldn't fly. I was too frightened to go back. So, uh, You know, yeah, that's did the best they could, um, but <laughs> I couldn't. I you know, don't blame you. I, no. I had. Oh, I only went on a plane for the first time in September of this year. Wow! I'm, in two and a half years, I hadn't gone on one. So yeah, I, I understand. I, I definitely understand, Louise. It has been such a pleasure. Oh, thank you. It such has fun. Great so fun. fun. I'm so glad Judy suggested we do this. Well, Judy. Judy, we call each other. I say, Judy, Judy, Judy. She's Lulu, Lulu, Lulu. <laughs> like, we're ridiculous. We call each other on Jeopardy. We we're Jeopardy addicts. So we uh -huh. call every night uh, during Jeopardy or after it or something to be bemoan whatever has just happened. It, it's just, she's adorable. And she was so, she worked so hard. She was such a good casting person. She was. She cast a lot of great she, people. Oh my God. Oh my God. So Who cast? Yeah. Oh. So many great. You stay well. Such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Alan. Bye, Louise. Great fun. Take care. You too. What do I do now? You don't have to do anything. I'll click out and here we go. Ah! <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Louise Sorrell, for sitting down for this fabulous interview. If you like today's interview, click the like. Uh, the like button. Don't miss a very special tribute.
to As the World Turns is Catherine Hayes next Thursday, November 17th. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel down below and turn on notifications for all upcoming shows. You can download audio versions of The Locker Room. Just search The Locker Room on your favorite st streaming platform. Have a great weekend, everybody, and I will see you next week.